So welcome everybody. My name is Sarah Sumner and this is our Bible in two hours series and today we're doing the book of Ezra. As usual, I've made a very elaborate worksheet for you. So if we look at the introduction here, we're going to see God's promise to Abraham. In Genesis chapter 12, God chooses a man named Abram who becomes Abraham and Abraham is the father of the Jews. So you probably heard of Abraham. If we're get, we haven't done the book of Genesis yet, we will get to that. But God has a promise to Abraham, who's the father of Isaac and the father of Jacob. And Jacob is the father of the 12 tribes of Israel. And this is the beginning of the history of Israel, of God's people. And all of this is laying out historical, relational, detectable, you can find it, okay, group of people that God is working through so that God can show God's self through the Messiah, okay? So Jesus is Jewish, and all of this history of the Old Testament is highlighting, giving us the historical context that's going to eventually lead us to our Lord. Now, we don't get there yet, and we're not going to get there in the book of Ezra, but that's why we're talking about this starting from Abraham as opposed to starting from Adam. But if you look on your worksheet, we're starting about God's promise, and God promises to make Abram, Abraham a nation, a great nation, all right? And so what happens is God raises up Abraham's relative. He is a grandson, great-great-grandson. We can count all the greats of Jacob, and you get to Moses. Now, a lot of people know about Moses because you've seen the movie of the Ten Commandments. Moses leads the people out of bondage when Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, when Jacob is there in the land of Israel, we're going to look at a map pretty soon. There was a famine and they had to migrate down. They had to emigrate down into Egypt where they could get food. And when they were in Egypt, they became slaves. And the Israelites are all slaves. The Hebrews are slaves in Egypt. And God raises up Moses. There's a whole story with that. And Moses leads them out of Egypt. He leads them out of Egypt, and now I want us to go to Exodus 19, because this is going to come up when we read the book of Ezra, and I want you to have it at the front of your mind that in, in Exodus chapter 19, verse 6, the Bible says, and this is God speaking, and you shall be to me, that if you've, in your Bible, the, the word me is capitalized in my Bible, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. This is what God says through Moses to the people of Israel. So let's look on your sheet. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. So now look, let's think about this. God has a promise to Abraham that I'm going to make a nation out of you. I'm going to make a people out of you. So it goes Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the 12 tribes of Israel, the 12 tribes of Jacob. Jacob is Israel. That's his name. And Israel is also the nation itself. So one of Jacob's great, great, when you count down, sons ends up having, uh, through that lineage comes Moses. Moses leads the people out of Egypt because the very same idea that God has of having a people, God says through Moses that you're going to be a kingdom, not just a kingdom, but you're going to be a kingdom of priests. You're not just going to be a nation, but you're going to be a holy nation. So now let's look. God raises up Joshua. They go to the land. Moses they sojourn, and there's a whole big saga, epic story. They get to the land. Joshua comes up to the land. We're talking about east of the Mediterranean Sea, goes through a whole conquest of the land, and they overtake the Canaanites, the, the, the Perizzites, the, the Hittites, all of these Canaanite native people in that land before the Israelites get there. And we're going to hear about those people in the book of Ezra. So all of this is a preface for you, so you'll understand the, the history. So God raises up Joshua. There's a whole book of the Bible called Joshua to lead the conquest. The conquest means to overtake these people who are there in the land, and so that that land would be the land of Israel. And then there's an interval time. So the people are now in the land that God promised. They're in that land. And then there's a, a period of judges where it's a different type of authority that the Israelites are under. They don't have a king. They don't have a monarchy. They don't have a democracy. They're under judges. If you don't understand uh, exactly what that means, 
we have a whole two hours on the book of Judges and you can find it on our website. So I encourage you to watch that. So there you have this, the season of the Judges and then you go into the time of the Kings. So when you're reading 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, 1 Kings, 2 Kings, 1 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles, it's all about the history of Israel, namely the Israeli monarchy. Now, of course, this is going to lead to Jesus, the king of the Jews, but we're not going to get there yet. We're still in the Old Testament. And when you've got this Jewish monarchy of the kings, we remember the story that King Saul is the first king. And King Saul has a united nation. Then you've got King David, and David is over a united Israel. Then you have King Solomon, who's over a united Israel. Those are the first three kings, Saul, David, Solomon. Then there's a split in the kingdom. The kingdom splits into the north and to the south. And in the north is Israel, and in the south is Judah. And so it's really confusing when you're reading in First and Second Kings and First and Second Chronicles, like going, wait, who's king and how can they all be, how can you have simultaneous kings? You understand that when you understand there's a split in the kingdom. So you, you have two kings going, but they're over different domains. All right. Now, what happened is most of these kings are bad. Most of these kings do evil. Most of these kings don't, don't, they don't live. They don't teach the people to live as a holy nation. They're, they're, they're not teaching the people to live as a royal priesthood. They're not doing Exodus 19. They're not being to God a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. We've got to remember that's the history of Israel. Otherwise, we're not going to understand the book of Ezra at the level that I want to help you understand it. Okay, so now what happens is these king, the, the kingdom is divided in Israel. And you have so much sin, and sometimes you have repentance and great reform, and there's a lot of drama. And we've been through all those books together in this series. And then what happens is they don't do God's will. They send their way into being overtaken. So you can't uphold a society when people are lying, when the authority figures are rampantly abusing power and there's no one to hold them accountable. You just can't do the society. It doesn't work because you break down trust, there's so much to it. And this is what happens in Israel. They're not worshiping God. And guess what happens? The, the Assyrians come and overtake the North. So when that kingdom divides, Israel's overtaken by the Assyrians. Now the Judah in the South, they have, they have more kings who are godly. They have better leadership. And so they hold out a little longer before they're overtaken by Babylon. And so I want you to see the history here on the sheet. The Babylonians conquer Judah and they deport them. The deporting means they go out of the land of Israel and they actually make them reside further to the east in the land of Assyria, further to the east in Babylonia, which is present day Iraq. So all of this is real. These are not fairy tales. This is actual history that people can rely on a lot of it, the only source you have is scripture, but it corroborates with other things. So we're looking at the veracity, the truthfulness, the faithfulness. You can count on it, history of the Bible to understand what's gone on. And God's people, they go into exile when they're deported. Their exile means they're living in a land that's not their own land. Now, I have a map for you soon, but we're not going to get to that map just yet. And I have a lot of upfront things I want to say to you. So right now we're starting going, okay, the book of Ezra comes at the time when the people have been deported to Assyria, they've been deported to Babylon, and now they're going to come back. They're going to come back to the land of Israel. Israel right now, as you know, in 2021, where that land is, that's the same that's the same real estate that we're talking about. We're talking about just to the east of the Mediterranean Sea, okay? And we're not talking about up in Europe, and we're not talking into Africa, but kind of right in between. And as those of you who know, remember that's how Solomon got so rich. Because if you live right in between Europe and Africa on that trade route, you could just get a little piece of the action on all those transactions and pocket the money. And as a broker, you can make a whole bunch of money. Solomon, King Solomon was a broker. That's how he got so rich. Okay, and that was God's plan because of Solomon's prayer to God. That's another story. Now, here's the deal. There's a scholarly debate, and we're not going to get into this debate, but I want you to understand this debate. There's a scholarly debate out there 
among academics who take the Bible seriously, and they're asking this question, does the story of the Old Testament, does that story, that larger story that I just gave you a very tiny little sketch of in the broadest strokes, does the story of the Old Testament of God bringing in, telling to Abraham, Abraham, I'm going to give you land. And then they are deported from the land and they're in, in Egypt. Moses brings them back to the land. Joshua takes them through that land. They settle the land. They have the kings. They lose the land and they're deported. And now they're going to come back to the land. Is that story of them coming back to the land, is that part of the big story of the Old Testament? There's a scholarly debate to go on. Is the book of Ezra, along with the book of Nehemiah, is that part of the big story or not? Now, why would somebody ask such a question? Now, here's the crux of it. I want you to see this. I made a little, I made a little chart for you so that you can see this outstanding on your page one of your worksheet. If you don't have the worksheet, this is going to be really hard to follow. This, I'm not making a tape for you to listen in your car. I guess you could do that. What I want you to do is get your Bible out. And I'm going to, I'm, my whole goal here is to help you read the book of Ezra and understand it. So I've got this little chart for you. And it said the crux of the story of the debate here is in the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah instructs the Israelites to live in exile and to seek the welfare of the land, of the city, of the foreign land, the foreign city where they live. And because Jeremiah does that, and Jeremiah, what is there, 52 chapters of Jeremiah? Jeremiah features prominently in the Old Testament. And because of that exile, some people would say, and the story is the exile. And Jeremiah said, stay here and help Babylon. But now you've got a story that is the opposite. The opposite is you have Ezra coming down from Babylon and he seeks to restore Israel to its land in order to rebuild the temple, rebuild the altars. I put this in yellow to reestablish the Torah. This is the Old Testament. So wait a second, you've got Jeremiah saying, stay here in the foreign land, it's okay. And you got Ezra saying, come on, everybody, let's go home. And we're going we're gonna to do it in our own land. We're going to live in our own land. We're going to be Exodus 19.6. We're going to be a holy nation. We're going to be that, a kingdom of priests in our own land. So you see, this is the scholarly debate. Now, from my point of view, we don't need to debate about it. Why can't we just have something simultaneous and say God has an assignment for Jeremiah in Babylon? He has an assignment for Ezra who is going to come down from Babylon. Now, the whole book of Ezra, we can ask the question, who wrote the book of Ezra? And you're going to see, for sure, it's speaking in first person from Ezra himself. But guess what? And I have this on your sheet later. We don't even meet Ezra until chapter 7. So you have so much history in understanding the book of Ezra. Otherwise, you're somebody who you're trying to read the Bible on your own. And you're like, I just don't understand it. And that's because God made it to where we have to have teachers. I had to have a teacher too. God is a God who raises up teachers. As a matter of fact, Ezra was a teacher. And right now in the church, we have in America, I believe, a tremendous tragic crisis of lack of good teaching to teach us to the point that we would all have moral courage, that we would have integrity, that the church would be salty salt, that we would be a self-cleaning oven, that we would be taking care of our discipling, our children. We would have whole generations that would still be walking with the Lord. We've got a teaching crisis. We haven't had full Lord teaching. Now, this is a concern to Ezra because this is something that happened in his day. And so teaching matters. As a matter of fact, in the New Testament, it says on the Lord's bond servant, that means you, if you're a believer, the Lord's bond servant must be able to teach. So if you care about teaching at all, this is going to be a really interesting book for you, the book of, of Ezra. Okay, now let's look at this. The scholarly debate, I want to say one more thing. Does the main story of the Old Testament flow through Ezra and Nehemiah or not? Because the crux says, Jeremiah says, stay in the land, go for the welfare in the foreign land. And Ezra saying, no, let's go home and let's rebuild the temple. Now here's the crux. Ezra starts out by quoting Jeremiah. Isn't that interesting? The first part of Ezra is quoting Jeremiah. And so we're going to talk about Jeremiah at our next meeting. 
But what I want us to do first is let's turn to Second Chronicles. Can everybody find that? First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles. Let's go to Chronicles because remember we said most of the kings were they did evil. Some of the kings did good. Let's go to the end of when I and I understand the grammar that you can do well, but I'm talking about doing good as like doing good things. They did good. They brought good into the society. Let's look in Second Chronicles, chapter 36, the very end. Okay. Now we've gone through this in the story. What happens is this: if you if you read the story with understanding, you know God brought them into the land. It's such a big deal. They were in their land. He raised up kings. They had had reform. Then they kept sinning. They kept serving the wrong God. And then finally, it, it ends up with them losing their land. And they don't just lose the land. They lose the temple. There's a terrible burning. Jerusalem is ransacked. You've got foreigners coming in. Can you imagine this from the king's point of view going, no, no. God chose us. We're Jewish people. He chose us to be a holy nation. We're a kingdom of priests. We can't fall. It's inconceivable for Israel to fall. We will not let go. No. And for those of us who live in America, people have told us most of our lives, America is the city on a hill. America is exceptional. America is the top card. There's no way America can fall. That's inconceivable. Now, I'm not trying to make a political statement. What I'm trying to do is help you understand the mentality of the king who won't let go in 2 Chronicles 36. Let's look at verse 19. Then they burned the house of the God. Who's they? That's the foreigners who come in. They're, they're, losing, their, they're losing their sovereignty. And they burned the house of God and they broke down the wall of Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the capital of Judah, the southern kingdom. If you're reading this with understanding, you're probably just sobbing, going, oh, my gosh. They, they burned down the house of God. They broke down the wall of Jerusalem. They burned all its fortified buildings with fire. And they destroyed all its valuable articles. And those who had escaped from the sword, he carried away to Babylon. See, the Babylonians came and got him. Remember when we did Habakkuk? And Habakkuk is like, oh, Lord, these Chaldeans, these Babylonians, they're merciless. They're going to come get us. And God's saying, yep, they are. They're going to come get you, and you're going to have to station yourself and wait. But take heart, because when they do this, I'm doing something so marvelous, you wouldn't even believe it, Habakkuk. And Habakkuk ends with him trembling, going, they're going to come get us. And now we see they're coming to get you, and they just burned down the temple. The city is ransacked. And those who escaped from the sword, Babylon carried away to Babylon, right? He, the, the leader here, and they were servants to him and to his sons all the way until the kingdom of Persia. So we need to know some background because the Babylonians get conquered by the Persians. So I'm going to go over that with you in a, in a minute, but let's keep reading this. They escaped from the sword. Some people didn't get killed in a bloody by a bloody sword, but they got carried away. They physically with their bodies, they had to deport. They had to move like pack up. We don't live at home in Israel anymore. We now live in Babylon and they lived there and they were servants to the Babylonian government all the way until the rule of the kingdom of Persia that had taken over Babylon. And they did all this. Verse 21, Second Chronicles 36. Verse 21, all this happened, look, to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah. Now we're back to that scholarly debate. It was all from the word of Jeremiah. When we get through there next time, you're going to hear Jeremiah telling him over and over, you're going to go into exile. You've sinned your way into exile. You've sinned and sinned and sinned. You did not repent. God kept giving you chance after chance after chance, opportunity after opportunity to repent. And you hardened your heart and you did not repent. And this is a word for us today. And now we're looking at this while well, they burned down the house of God. And it all happened to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah until the land had enjoyed its Sabbaths. See, so he had to rest the land. The land was so weary of the people's sin. All the days of its desolation, it kept Sabbath until 70 years were complete. 
Now, this prophecy was it's going to be 70 years of devastation. Now, if you read carefully, you're going to find out God is so kind. It actually wasn't a full 70 years. Now, I'm thinking of other stories where God tells David, you're going to get three, three days of pestilence. And King David said, God, I'll choose you. Remember that? I'm reverting to another story. Somebody goes, wait, what is she talking about? I'm saying... They had to go into desolation 70 years, and God is so kind, it wasn't a full 70 years. And it reminds me of a story when David had a choice from God. King David, send up a storm, and God told him, here's your choice, A, B, or C. And the last one was, God's going to zap you with three days of pestilence. And David said, you know what? I'll take God's zap, because God is so kind. I'll just rather be zapped by God than somebody else. And God he kind of lowered this up. He's just so kind. So you could miss that. It's not written here, but that comes out later. Now, verse 22. Look at this. Now, in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, because Persians took over the Babylonians. We don't see that here, but that's what happened. Now, in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he sent a proclamation throughout his kingdom, and he also put it in writing saying, thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, quote, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has appointed me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever there is among you of all his people, May the Lord his God be with him and let him go up, unquote. So this terrible tragedy ends with this huge surprise. Now, if you know me, I write mission statements, vision statements, and why statements. Well, guess what my own why statement is? My why statement is I believe God surprises us with yet another jackpot every time we truly trust in him. And so now... The people who are trusting God are finding out God raises up a foreigner, King Cyrus of Persia, to rebuild the house of God in Judah, in Jerusalem. Here's God surprising us with a jackpot because <laughs> God is just so faithful and so kind. So now here we go back to your worksheet. That's Second Chronicles. Okay, it's 36. Now we're toward the bottom of page one, and I want to show you the history. You can look at this other sources, but I'm always trying to help you save some time. And when you look at the bottom of page one, it says the Babylonians conquered the Assyrians. Okay, and you can, I'm giving you some resources where you can look at that. Then what happens is the Persians take over the Babylonians. Then you keep looking, and then you find out, oh, and then the Greeks take over the Persians. And then what happens is the Romans take over the Greeks. And by the time you get to Jesus, it's the Romans in charge. Pilate, Herod, all of this. The Israelites in the New Testament, they don't, they're don't. they they're not governing themselves. They lost their sovereignty. They're in their land governed by foreigners. So this is all part of it. How did that happen? They send their way into that. It's not how the story had to go. And God telling them, do my way. Obey me, and you're going to have a different story than if you don't obey me. However, even when you disobey, God is so kind and faithful to his promise to Abraham. Now we're at the beginning of the worksheet. God's promise to Abraham that God fulfills God's promise, even though the Israelites didn't keep their end of the deal, just like how you and I don't keep our end of the deal, where we say, God, I'll be committed to you, and then we aren't. And that we fail. And here's God still committed to us anyway. But God is so kind to the one whose heart is belongs to him. So you give your heart. And I want to invite you right now. If you're like, you know what? You might need to rededicate yourself to the Lord right now. And go, all right, I'm going to read the book of Esther. And God, count me in. I've had it. I don't want to not be in anymore. <laughs> I want to follow you. And I want to understand your word. And this is what I want to do. So now let's go to page two. Here's the time frame. The Old Testament book of Ezra is written during the time of the Persian Empire. Now, we've already done the book of Esther, and Esther was in a Persian Empire. Yes, it's the same Persian Empire, but it's not necessarily the same person in charge, okay? Because you get different kings 
at different times. So the Persians come after who? They come after the Babylonians. So if you know it's a Persian government, you say, is this the time of King David? No, King David was sovereign king over Israel in the land of Israel, but they lost their land, right? And they got deported to Babylon. The Babylonians were taken over by the Persians. And so this is the time of the Persian government. You have to keep repeating that to yourself so you start to get a, an idea of the time frame, not just by looking at a chart, but by internalizing it. So when you pick up the Bible, you read it and you understand. Let's look at your worksheet. Ezra chapter one, can we go there? Let's look at Ezra chapter one, verse one. Now, in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah, the Lord stirred up in the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia. He stirred up that spirit so that he sent a proclamation throughout all his kingdom. Oh, wait, oh, wait, oh, wait, 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 did, are we reading Second Chronicles or are we reading Ezra? Do you see how similar they are? It's very similar. It's like, wow, whoever wrote Ezra has some understanding of Second Chronicles. Second Chronicles and Ezra are saying the same thing. Now, in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he sent a proclamation throughout all the kingdom and also put it in writing, saying, quote, Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has appointed me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever there is among you of all his people, may his God be with him. Let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and rebuild, not the house of Cyrus, rebuild the house of the Lord. Rebuild the house of the Lord, the God of not of Persia, the God of Israel. He is the God who is in Jerusalem. Verse 4, and every survivor at whatever place he may live, let the people of that place support him with silver and gold, with goods and cattle, together with a free will offering for the house of God, which is in Jerusalem. This is remarkable. King Cyrus of Persia is saying, let the people go back and rebuild the temple and let them have a bunch of money. Because God has raised me up to do this good thing that isn't even in my country. And it's making this admission that this is the God of Israel and that I, King Cyrus, who am over all these provinces, this huge empire, I'm admitting there's a God of Israel and I'm actually funding this with quote unquote Persian money. <laughs> this, is, this is no small thing. If you're not sort of in awe already, then I haven't explained this very well. Okay, so let's look on your sheet, the time frame. Ezra chapter one through six happens at about the time of 538 BC to 516 BC. Okay, so if you go, King Cyrus comes into, comes into his reign in 539 BC. Okay, so you're thinking, wait, wait, Jesus is born roughly three AD. We don't really know. I mean, Anno Domini, the year of our Lord, A.D. So right now we're in 2021, 2021 years since A.D. This is talking about 539 years before that. That's when King Cyrus comes in. Okay, now let me give you some, I didn't put this on your worksheet. When is King David? He's about 1000 B.C. Okay, so you've got King David at about 1000 B.C. And now we've gone hundreds of years, haven't we? So when you've got you've got all these kings and this king led this king led for 50 years this one led for six years we've got all that chronicled in first and second Samuel especially in first and second Kings and second Chronicles where you get into the lineage of the kings right so you have to understand this is not all happening you're just turning a page but it doesn't mean this happened five minutes later in the story there might be a lot of years in between and I want you to read this with understanding. So now look at this on your worksheet, about 60 years transpired between chapter six and chapter seven. So you might want to write in your Bible, 60 years later, you know how in a movie it'll have a scene and then it goes dark and then it, and it appears and it'll say 60 years later, let's put that in between chapter six and chapter seven. So that really what's gonna happen when you're in chapter one, by the time 
when we get to chapter seven, when Ezra makes his appearance, if we're going to have a movie, Ezra doesn't star in the, he's the star of the show, but he doesn't appear till chapter seven. Actually, Israel has already been settling in their land for 80 years by that time, right? Because if it's 60 years later and you look at this and say, oh, 538, you know, to, to 516, that's what, you know, how many years is that? Rough about 20 years. So now Ezra comes to Jer Jerusalem about 80 years into the resettlement of Israel. Got it? We're still getting our preface, right? So we're connecting Ezra to the book of Jeremiah. We're connecting Ezra to the book of Second Chronicles. We're connecting Ezra to the very beginning in Genesis chapter 12, all the way from Abraham. We're going, this is part of the story. And the scholarly debate, is this part of the main story? Or is this sort of a side note? Is this? Hmm. And we won't go any further on that, but I just like raising the question. So now let's go, let's do some who's who, because you're like, oh, I get so lost and there's just tons of gobs of names all in this, in this book. So I'm not going to tell you all the names because there's way too many, but I'm going to give you a few of them. First off, there's Ezra. Who is Ezra? Ezra is a scholar. Remember I told you he's a teacher. Ezra is a teacher. He's a priest. He's a, he's a reformer. And now next on your list, I put Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel is a builder, okay? And I'm going to tell you a little bit more about Zerubbabel. You'll see it right here. Zerubbabel is King Jehoiachin's, you know, how many grandson, you know, he's his, he's his uh, grandson of King Jehoiachin. King Jehoiachin is there at the end when Jerusalem is getting sacked by Babylon, okay? Around in that area, I'm not going to say the exact chronology, but towards the end of the kingdom, toward the tail end comes Jehoiachin. I gave you a chart about that. You can check your chart if you went to First and Second Kings and First and Second Chronicles, okay? And so now you've got Yeshua, and he's the high priest. He's also a builder. They're going to go back. What are they building? We already know. They came back to build the house of God. They came back to build the temple. Remember, it got burned. So they're going to come back and build it. They're going to build the altars. They're actually working. They are physically building. Okay? It's not metaphorical. They are actually doing this. They're actually building. Now, Yeshua, isn't it interesting? It sounds a lot like Jesus. So Joshua, who came and did the conquest, Yeshua coming in to build, and Jesus is Yeshua, Hamashiach, the Messiah. These are all kind of archetypes to help us understand Jesus. There's too much to say there, just, just giving you a little footnote. So you got Yeshua, who's the high priest, and then you've got Haggai and Zechariah, and these are the two who are also, their whole book, there's a whole book of the Bible called Haggai, whole book in the Bible, Zechariah, is like the last big, longer book in the Minor Prophets, right? I mean, it, it ends with Malachi, but you've still got Zechariah in there. These are Minor Prophets who minister in support of the rebuilding projects. So remember, we haven't done Haggai yet. It's all about rebuilding the temple. But these are on the scene. They're historical contemporaries of each other, okay? And so what we've got right now is got Ezra, who's the teacher, scholar, reformer. And then you've got the builders, Zerubbabel, Yeshua, and now you've got the minor prophets who are there cheering people on. They're speaking the word of the Lord, going, go ahead and build. They're, they're cheering on this work. And now we're going to look at the symbolism here. Look at this. This is just incidental, but isn't it interesting? You've got the prophet. Jesus is the prophet, priest, and king. You've got Haggai and Zechariah. I call them H and Z on your worksheet. They're the prophet, and Yeshua is the priest, and Zerubbabel. They're symbolizing the king. That's interesting. And it's not accidental. Okay. Now, let's look. Because you've also got Rahum, who is the commander, and Shimshai, the scribe. And these are enemies of the Jews. And what you see in scripture, you always have these enemies of the Jews. Okay. Now, Jesus is Jewish. And so, what we really have is an enemy of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah. When I say HaMashiach, I'm saying that in Hebrew, and it means the Messiah. So you say, Jesus, the Messiah, there's all this enmity, hatred, envy toward our Lord. So now if you're a Christian and you have our Lord inside you, you've accepted him, you're indwelt by him, then you're going to have enemies that are really not your enemies. They're enemies of him. So Jesus later says, if they hate you, it's because they really hate me. So you see these plots 
And there's a lot of New Testament teaching on how do we understand these plots because God is building our character. Okay, there's so much more to say about that. But these enemies of the Jews, this 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 is thematic in the Old Testament on its own merit, even before Jesus comes, before before the word becomes flesh. So these are real live political enemies of the Jewish people in a Jewish way, pre-Christianity. Ahasuerus, Ahasuerus, Artaxerxes, Cyrus, Darius, Osnapur, which is like Ashurbanipal. Osnapur is, you might've heard of Ashurbanipal. That's the same guy as Osnapur. These are all kings of Persia. So when you learn Persian history, where Iran is now is former Persia, okay? So if you're somebody who's Iranian, you would say, I'm Persian, okay? And then you've got Tatanai and, and Sheshbazar. These are governors. So what I'm trying to do, I told you all that vertically, just kind of in a prose way on your worksheet. But now look, I made a handy dandy chart for you, but I didn't fill it all out so that you can really learn this because while you guys are listening to me, I'm at home typing out all these verses. I'm really internalizing it. It's like, wow, how does she know this? I'll tell you what, if you go home and type it all out, you'll learn it too. You go home and read and study and go over this and learn the language all that, you can learn it too. But the big key is really going slowly to look at, listen to every single verse. So what I'm trying to do, I'm, I'm challenging you in a way that I haven't. With the book of Ezra, I made you a chart and I have some other things in this teaching as well. Okay, so let's make it, I want to get this in your head because it's, I don't want you to be confused when we read, read Ezra. Look at this. On your chart, you've got the reformers, the builders, the prophets who are in support, you got the enemies, and you got the authority figures. Isn't that handy dandy? So I build in some of that. And as we go, if you're like, wait, I'm trying to remember who's on first and who everybody is, you have your handy dandy chart. Okay. To help yourself keep straight. Now we got to get some geography because like, wait a second, where are we? Because this is a real story. And this book is going to, numerous times, it's going to mention the capital R river. Now, when we're in Israel, usually that river is the Jordan River. When we're talking about Egypt, we're talking about the Nile River, but we're not there. We got deported to Babylon and Babylon got overtaken by the Persians. So now we're talking about this great river, the capital R River is the Euphrates River. All right, so I made a copy of a map here that I think is helpful because there's another river is the River of Ahava. And we'll come to that later, but let's look at this map. Okay, do you see this map on the worksheet? The Persian Empire, boy, this is big. It goes all in, look, it encompasses Egypt. It goes way south of Egypt. It goes all the way into Libya. Look at that far west on the south side of the, the southern shores of the Mediterranean Sea. Got it? Look at there, it extends all the way over. It just goes all the way through Israel up to Damascus, to Syria. Look, it goes all the way up through present day Turkey. It reaches over there. It doesn't quite make it to Greece. Isn't that interesting? And we know the Greeks are gonna take over after that. So I think it's interesting going, wow, they never did conquer Greece. Greece is fixing to conquer, conquer them, but that hadn't happened yet. And so you look and you go, wow, this whole land over here from in between the, the Mediterranean Sea and the Black Sea, that's all Persian. You go all the way to the Caspian Sea, they've got all that land. You go all the way further, wow, all the way to almost to India. Just right there, see it? And then it goes up even north of India to the Northwest. It goes up there, up to the Aral Sea. Got that? This is a big, it's an empire. It's a big outfit. So we got to understand that, to understand the significance of that. Okay, so everybody can see, let's take a look. You see the great sea on there? That's the Mediterranean Sea. Now look to the right of the Mediterranean Sea. See where it says Samaria? Now go just under that, it says Jerusalem. That's Jerusalem, that's where it got burned. And they're gonna go back to Jerusalem. I have another map for you, we'll get to it soon. Okay, if you wanna pace with me, I wanna tell you one more thing. We're gonna go look in Jeremiah. We're gonna look at Jeremiah, the whole thing soon. I keep saying that, I hope you can come. But let's go to Jeremiah because Jeremiah's uh, chapter five, I think it's really helpful for us to understand this before we read Ezra. Now this, if I was gonna write my own commentary on Ezra, I would put Jeremiah five in there and into Jeremiah seven. 
but I haven't seen that in a commentary. And here's what I'm proposing. I'm proposing that these sins talked about in Jeremiah are going to be figuring into why the situation is as it is in Ezra. So let's just look at Jeremiah 5, okay? And Jeremiah 5, roam to and fro through the streets of Jerusalem and look now and take note and seek in her open squares and see if you can find one person who does justice. Jeremiah is saying, Israel, and he's talking to the southern kingdom especially, going, you all have sinned so much you have been so unfaithful to God you have not trusted God things are so bad you're not telling the truth you're lying to each other there's so much corruption in your institutions your your culture is so far gone and wayward that the call here that from the mouth of Jeremiah speaking the word of the Lord that the Lord is saying roam to and fro Jeremiah and I want you to roam to and fro through the streets of Jerusalem and look now and take note and see if you can just find one righteous person. Is there anybody who isn't lying through the day? Is there anybody who's not cheating other people? Is there anybody with integrity? Doesn't this remind you of the story of Abraham when Abraham's praying for a lot and going, Lord, oh, please don't burn down Sodom. What if there's 50 people, 45, 30, 35? What if there's just 10 people, God? But now he's got it all the way down to one. What if there's just one person? This is how bad it is. The situation is dire. If there's just one person who does justice and look and who seeks truth. So what's under siege is truth. Is there anybody telling the truth? So now in our culture today, people can say, what are you saying? You're not saying that all these corruption. There's no way we have this much corruption and going, hey, you know what? It's not unprecedented. If you don't have righteous leaders, if you get out from under God, you just can't believe how much corruption can multiply in authority structures and in, in the institutions. See, if there's one person who does justice, one person who seeks truth, then I'll pardon her. And although they say, as the Lord lives, even when they say, as the Lord lives, that's just false. They're just swearing falsely. And, and look at verse 3. Oh, Lord, do not your eyes look for truth. God is looking for truth. Does anybody tell the truth? And then he goes on and look in verse 3. They have refused to repent. Look in verse 7. Why should I pardon you? Look in verse 8. They're well-fed, lusty horses. Verse 11. They, built, they have dealt very treacherously with me. Look at verse 12. They've lied about the Lord. They're saying, Look at this, verse 12. Misfortune won't come on us. We're Israel. We're Judah. We're faithful. We got chosen by God. It's inconceivable for us to fall. Verse 14, God says, Behold, I'm making my words in your mouth fire, and I'm going to make these people wood. And when you speak, they're just going to catch a flame because this is so, so appalling to the Lord God himself. Now look at this. Verse 17, and they're going to demolish with the sword your fortified cities. Look, your cities in which you trust. You're trusting in the city as opposed to trusting in the Lord. Now look at this. Do you not fear me? Verse 22. Look at verse 24. They do not say in their heart, let us now fear the Lord our God. They're not fearing God. Look at verse 27. They're full of deceit. We'll go over this again when we do Jeremiah, but look in chapter 6, verse 17, and God says, I sent watchmen over you saying, listen to the sound of the trumpet. Therefore, hear, O nations, and know, O congregation, what is among them. Verse 19, Jeremiah, chapter 6, verse 19, hear, O earth, behold, I am bringing disaster on this people, the fruit of their plans. I'm laying a stumbling block for them. Their neighbors and their friends are going to perish, verse 21. And, and now let's go to chapter 7. The word of the Lord that came to Jeremiah, he says in chapter 7, verse 2, stand in the gate of the Lord's house. Okay, now everybody dial in. Chapter 7, Jeremiah, verse 2. I want you to see that word house. Because Ezra's going to go up and rebuild the house. 
Ezra, the book of Ezra, Ezra's not the builder. It's Zerubbabel and Yeshua. They're going to go rebuild the house. And then Ezra's going to have his part. We'll see. But now the point that I'm drawing out is they're trusting in their cities. They're sending up a storm. And now look in chapter 7. Stand in the gate of the Lord's house. He's talking to Jeremiah. And proclaim there in the house of the Lord this word. Hear the word of the Lord, all you Judah, who enter by these gates to worship the Lord. By the gates of the house of the Lord. Verse 3. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, amend your ways and your deeds, and I'll let you dwell in this place. You got to repent. You can't keep lying to each other. You can't keep stealing and cheating and murdering and doing all this treachery you're doing. You got to stop. Look at this. Verse 4. Do not trust in deceptive words, saying, This is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. Quit calling this the temple of the Lord because you're not making it the temple of the Lord. Look at this. Verse 5. For if you truly amend your ways and your deeds, if you truly practice justice between a, a man and his neighbor, a person and a person, if you stop doing all these sins, verse 8, because you're trusting in deceptive words, you're swearing falsely, verse 10, then you want to come in here and you think you can do all these abominations? God is saying, do you really think I'm not noticing this? You're doing this in my house, calling it the temple of the Lord? You've got all this treachery, all this idolatry happening in my house, and God doesn't like it. And now we know at the back of Second Chronicles chapter 36, what's God going to do? He's going to let that get burned down to smithereens by the Babylonians. God's going to let God's house get burned down because they polluted his house with so much idolatry, so many deceptive words. That in Jeremiah 5, they're going, is there even is there just even one person who can tell the truth? One person. Everybody's capitulated. And you might say, well, everyone's capitulated, so it's okay to capitulate. No. No. That is not what the Bible teaches. And so here's Jeremiah the prophet. He's he's been, by God's grace, he's not doing this treachery. He's a prophet. He's speaking up. And now look at verse 11. Has this house, I have the word house in my Bible circle. Has this house, which is called by my name, become a, become a den of robbers in your sight? Behold, I, even I, the Lord, have seen it. I've seen it, declares the Lord. I see that you've turned my house into a den of robbers. It's all about money, power, abuse. You guys are siphoning money. You're worshiping the wrong God. And you want to say this is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the Christian institution, the church, the Christian university? No. Now, who does this remind you of? Remember the words den of robbers? This is Jesus quotes this, doesn't he? When he overturns the tables and he clears out those money changers. It comes right out of Jeremiah 7. I'll be saying that again. When we come back to it. But now look at this, verse 14. Chapter 7 of Jeremiah, verse 14. Therefore, I, God, will do to the house, which is called by my name, in which you trust. You're trusting not in God's name. You're trusting in the house. See, you trusted in the cities. You trusted in the house. You're trusting in these symbols, the power, the money, the institution, the prestige. And then you abuse the power. And you fell in love with all the trappings. And you forgot the God who gave it to you. And you didn't worship the God. And you want to call this God's house? God is like, I will not have it. I'm going to let them burn down my house. God is telling you, the temple building is not what it's about. The temple building is really important. Now, okay, now listen, did we say there's a scholarly debate do you see why there's a scholarly debate why would we come back and build the house that god let get burned down when they're when they're actually worshiping the house so he's saying you're trusting verse 14 jeremiah 7 14 you're trusting in that house which i gave you verse 15 and i'll cast you out i'll cast you out of my sight just like i've cast out your brothers now remember these people have gone out into exile. So this, this really resonates, you know, going, okay, 
So by the time we get to Ezra, to Ezra, people know this actually happened. Jeremiah is predicting it. He is foretelling it. He's really not predicting it. God is speaking the, the proclamation through him. But by the time Ezra's come, they've already been out, and then they've come back in for 80 years. Is everybody hearing that? So now there's a whole lot more we could talk about, but let's now go to Ezra because we're already 50 minutes into it. We only have 10 chapters, but I have a lot of stuff here to show you because there's a lot in Ezra. So Second Chronicles, after Second Chronicles, let's look in your Bible. It goes Second Chronicles, Ezra. Oh, isn't that interesting? If you look at my Bible, you've got Second Chronicles where it's talking about Cyrus is, Cyrus is making this proclamation. And then you get down to Ezra and it's just almost like instant replay cut, cut and copy paste. Very interesting. So you can see it again, and I believe it adds to the credibility of you seeing what's happened here. Okay, so now chapter one, what year is it? Is it what, what, the first year? Is it 539, 538 uh, BC, right? So we've already gone through those first four verses. So we know Cyrus is the king of Persia. He said, we're, we're fulfilling the mouth of Jeremiah. It's in fulfillment. It's not in opposition. You don't have to say, which do you trust, the Jeremiah account or the Ezra account? They go together. Ezra is all in fulfillment of the word of Jeremiah. That's what it says, that God stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, the king of Persia, so that he sent out this proclamation. And now let's look. He sends out the proclamation. Now let's go to Ezra chapter 1, verse 5. And it says, then the heads of the fathers of the households of Judah and Be Benjamin, that's the southern kingdom, right? Judah and Benjamin, that's southern Israel, that's the southern part, Judah. The heads of the fathers of Judah and Benjamin and the priests and the Levites, they arose. And everybody whose spirit God had stirred up to go rebuild the house of the Lord, which is in Jerusalem. So God put it in people's hearts. I want to go. I want to go help build. Me too. Same here. And he stirred them up, and people knew. Now listen, isn't that interesting? God stirred them up. They found out God's will by going, oh, I have a sense to do this. I want to do this. I've got to go do this. God stirred them, and they, and they, they self-select by that stirring. And now look on your worksheet, page three at the bottom, it's got the heads, the priests, the Levites. Got it? So we're following with the 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 story and understanding who we're talking about here now verse six and all those about them encourage them with here comes the money the silver the gold the goods the cattle the valuables when people put their money in something you know they mean business a lot of people will say something but if they don't put their dollars behind it they're not that serious about it but this King Cyrus, verse 7, Ezra, chapter 1, verse 7, also King Cyrus, he brought out the articles of the house of the Lord that Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar was the leader of the Babylonians, who looted the house of God, stole the treasuries in the house of God in Jerusalem, stole it, put it in the Babylonian treasuries. Well, guess what? Persia overtook Babylon, and now all that went to Persia, and it was all kept intact. Fascinating. It was kept intact. And now here we've got King Cyrus, who's taking all from the house of the Lord that Nebuchadnezzar had looted, and they're going to get that back into the house of the Lord in Israel. That's really attentive, providential, sovereign oversight of God, taking care of that set of articles of gold and silver, etc., that went into his house. Nebuchadnezzar had carried it away from Jerusalem and put it in the house of his gods. Now notice his gods is little g into his little idols. So all the treasures of the Lord got housed in an idolatrous palace to not God, to fake gods, to idols, to something that isn't God at all. And now it's been preserved all this time over all these decades and years. And, and, and this goes over centuries even. And now it's going to be brought back. Okay, so now we can start to understand Ezra in a way that isn't boring at all, because you can start to read this and go, boy, this is just a bunch of boring inventory. What a boring book. It's not boring. It's part of an epic story, right? 
Okay, so now let's look on your sheet. We're now on page four of your worksheet. Chapter one, verse seven. Also King Cyrus brought out the articles of the house of the Lord, which Nebuchadnezzar had carried away from Jerusalem, and he put it in the house of his gods. Now the last three verses, chapter one, verse eight, verse nine, verse 10. And Cyrus, the king of Persia, had them, that should be say T-H-E-M. He had them brought out by the hand of Midrath, a treasurer, and he counted it all. They take inventory and say, okay, do we have everything? And they do. Now, there's so much more we could say, things like, you know, this this guy, uh, Midradoth, the treasurer. I call him Midrath. Midradoth, the treasurer. It looks like his name is named after a Persian sun god. I could tell you more details like that. I didn't put it in your worksheet. But if you do a deeper study of Ezra, you're going to find things like that. Okay. And now, again, that adds to the credibility of the truthfulness of this preservation of the story of Ezra because it matches with other things we can corroborate with, like this name is a Persian name. Okay. So now we'll go to chapter two. So they got everything all inventory. They took care of it. You can read those details. Remember, my goal is to help you read Ezra and you understand it. So we go to chapter two. Now, these are the people of the province who came up out of the captivity of the exiles whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried away to Babylon. We understand that. We know what that's talking about, right? So hopefully you're like cheering going, I just read Ezra chapter two, verse one, and I understand it. I could explain this to somebody. Yay. So the king of Babylon had carried it away to Babylon, and he returned to Jerusalem and Judah, each to his city. So now these are the people that come. Zerubbabel, we know him. What did he do? He's a builder. We, we haven't found that out yet on this, but we know that's what's coming. And Yeshua, oh, we know him too. Oh, and Nehemiah, we got a whole book named Nehemiah. We're going to talk about that later. And then you've got all these names like going, oh, look, it says Mordecai. Oh, fascinating. It says Mordecai. We know Mordecai from the book of Ezra. Okay, I'm, I'm kind of pretty fascinated. People go, how did you read those names? How boring. Well, it's not boring when you know the stories. All right. Now you've got at the end of verse two, the number of the men, the people of Israel, the sons of, and now all this kind of like a census, like a genealogy, like counting, like who all went, who's everybody. And it and it's it's important when you're trying to keep track of who's got what. So we're not going to go through that right now. So let's look on your worksheet. So we've got chapter two. This is everybody. What are these people? Like you're reading these names and you might go, I'm already lost. I forgot what's happening. We don't want to forget what's happening is these are the people who are coming out of captivity. They're coming out of Babylon. They were carried into Babylon. They've returned to Jerusalem. Okay, and now we've got sons of the priests. Look at chapter two, verse 61. So you had all those people coming out, and now you've got the sons of the priests, the sons of the priests. That's what we're pointing out. Sons of Barzillai, we know that name. I won't say so much more. You've got some more details here. Let's look in verse 62. These people searched among their own ancestral registration but they couldn't be located. Therefore, they were considered unclean and they were not part of the priesthood. Okay, why do we care if they're unclean and they're not part of the priesthood? You could just skip over that and go, I missed it. I have no idea why, but we know why already. And why is that? I have a hint for you. It's on page one of your worksheet. Remember this? Exodus 19, verse six, because we're a holy nation. God hit the whole promise. The whole plan was a kingdom of priests and we got to make sure we got the right priests. It's a holy nation. It's not a compromised nation. It's a kingdom of priests, not a kingdom of fake priests. This is all about integrity. We're going to have the real deal. No more phony baloney. We've been saying, oh, temple of the Lord, temple of the Lord, phony baloney. Somebody blew the whistle. That's it. The temple's down. And now God's going to come back and go, we're going to rebuild. And we rebuild it. We're going to build it the right way. And it's going to be unto God. And we're going to have real priests with real genealogy. Now, all of a sudden, this genealogy is like, oh, my stars, this is really important. It's really important. And when I said, oh, my stars, that sounds kind of Persian, doesn't it? Remember Esther? Her name is Esther. Esther. Oh, my stars. Okay. That was Persian. All right. Here we go. Now, we've got chapter 2, verse 63. And the governor said to them that they should not eat from the most holy things. 
until a priest stood up with Urim and Thummim. Remember that? Urim and Thummim, that's kind of like their lot. That's their decision-making device. So if you get lost on that, Urim and Thummim, you see it earlier in the, in the Old Testament. It's not like, it's not dice, but like are you cast the straw. It's a way for them to have had some kind of discernment that was God-informed. And you can look it up more, but that's the, that's the idea there. Okay, so now chapter 2, verse 69. Look at this. And according to their ability, they gave to the treasury for the work of all this work. There's a payment being made, and they're depositing all this funds. So they're not just coming back and rebuilding without also building the treasury. They're actually restoring it. There's a real restoration happening. This is remarkable, and it's so heartening because, listen, when we lose so much and you're like, I've lost this, I've lost that, we've lost this, we've lost that, but God is a God of restoration. You might be somebody saying, I even lost my soul. God can restore your soul. He restoreth my soul. Let's go to chapter 2, verse 70. The priest and the Levites, some of the people, the singers, the gatekeepers, and the temple servants, what did they do? They lived. Where did they live? They lived in their cities. They're not worshiping the cities. They're living in the cities. They used to worship the city. They got messed up and got all idolatrous. But now they're living in the cities, and all Israel is living in their cities. It's like God saying, if you can't, if you can't live in your city without worshiping your city, I'm going to have to send you out of the city. And you're going to be out for 70 years, and I'm going to bring you back in when you can learn to live in the city. That sounds like a parent to me. Of a parent saying, look, the way you're tearing that up, you're going to have to put it down. You're going to have to go over here. And when you can come back and do it the right way. So right now we have lots of treachery in many industries, and we're not doing it right. Did the courts do the right thing? Did the lawyers do the right thing? Did the doctors do the right thing? Did the teachers do the right thing? The professors, the administrators, the agencies, all of this. And we're like going, do we have integrity in the land or not? Because God wants holiness and integrity among the people. So now we go to chapter three, verse one. Now, when the seventh month came and the sons of Israel, where are they? They're in the cities. The people gathered together as one person to Jerusalem. They have this incredible unity and they're in Jerusalem. What's Jerusalem? It's the capital of Judah. I would say Jerusalem is the most important city in the world today and every day. I try to pray regularly for peace in Jerusalem. God tells us, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Most important city isn't any other city. It's Jerusalem. So now here they are. They gather as one person in Jerusalem. I'm looking on her sheet, page four, chapter three, verse two. And I put it emboldened to help you keep track of who's who. Okay. Then Yeshua, the son of, we can call him Yazadak, and his brothers, the priest, and Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and his brothers arose. So you've got Yeshua and Zerubbabel and their brothers and their brothers. They arose. And what did they do? They built, what does it say? They built the altar of the God of Israel to offer offerings on it as it is written in the law of Moses. Law of Moses, the man of God. We know who Moses is. He led them out of Egypt. Remember that? Now, why in the world would you have to go back and build an altar? And why in the world would you build the altar first? Why would you do that? And we know the answer. The answer is Exodus chapter 19, verse 6. Because God wants a kingdom of priests. He wants a holy nation. And if you're going to have priests, you're going to have the sacrifices that God calls for. And you need an altar. You've got to have an altar. You're going to have the right kind of temple. You're not going to have a fake temple. This is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. Ha, ha, ha. It's really the money changers. This is where we make our big bucks. Oh, yeah, we say, give your money. It's going to go to God. Ha, ha, ha. It's really going to buy my yacht that I want to buy. That is not what God wants. He wants this integrity. And so you see this now, that they're getting the integrity back by rebuilding. Hey, listen, we can always rebuild, can't we? We can rebuild integrity right now. Everybody start building integrity in your own self, building integrity where you can. So you can see I've got the question and the answer right here. Why build an altar? Now let's go to 
your page four on your worksheet, we're on Ezra chapter three, verse three. So they set up the altar on its foundation. Now look at this, for they were terrified. For they were terrified. My number one value is the fear of the Lord. So I love that. And I put it in bold. They were terrified because of the people of the lands and they offered burnt offerings on it to the Lord. What? Wait, is it bad that they're scared of people of the land? They're so scared. Wait, what's happening here? Let me look at this. So they set up their altar on its foundation for they were terrified because of the people of the lands and they offered burnt offerings on it to the Lord, burnt offerings morning and evening. See, when you fear the Lord, you just do what's right and you're burning offerings to the Lord, even though you're scared of the people of the land. And you don't just say, well, we're scared of the people of the land, so we're not going to burn offerings to the Lord anymore. We're so scared we're going to offend somebody. So you know what? Let's just do a little time out on serving God because, yikes, oh, we better, we better do what the people of the land want us to do. And that's not what they're doing. They're actually sacrificing. Is that what it says? Am I reading this right? But look at that and go, they set up the altar on its foundation and they offered burnt offerings on it. And I have it in yellow in my Bible. They did it to the Lord. They offered burnt offerings to the Lord. You can just whiz past that and think that's nothing. It's a huge deal that they actually sacrificed to the Lord and not to some idol. And that's what we want to do is have sacrifices to the Lord. So I put that all in caps for you on your worksheet, chapter 3, verse 3. Now we've got chapter 3, verse 4. And they celebrated the Feast of Booths as it is written. I love that. As it is written, they followed the plan, the policy, the law, the word of God. They didn't say, eh, it says do this, but we're just going to do what we want to do. We don't really feel like following that. They didn't follow it as it is written. And they offered the fixed number of burnt offerings daily according to the ordinance as each day required. Do you see this? You could just be having, it's almost like fireworks. You could put little lines out of your Bible verse and put little lines up and just say integrity, 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 integrity. <laughs> so much integrity because they're doing the fixed number. They're doing the daily sacrifices according to the ordinance as each day required. Chapter three, verse five, and afterward, there was a continual burnt offering also for the new moons and for the fixed festivals of the Lord that were consecrated, like made holy, like set apart, like we're going to do this right unto God. We have another chance. We blew it. The whole thing got burned down, but now we're coming back and rebuild it. It's like God saying, okay, let's start all over. Let's try it again. You get a giant mulligan. You get to do it again. And from everybody who offered a free will, offering and i love it again so i put it in all caps this offering is going to the lord so now we have chapter three verse six at the bottom of page four from the first day of the seventh month they begin to offer burnt offerings to the lord but the foundation of the temple of the lord had not been laid okay let's get this straight everybody look on ezra three chapter three verse three so they set up the altar, the altar on its foundation. Got it? That was the altar on its foundation. Don't get confused here. And now we're going to see in verse 6, for the foundation of the temple had not been laid. Once the altar, once the temple. Now, the, the altar is part of the whole outfit of the temple. I just want you to see that difference because if you're whizzing by going, I don't understand this, you're going to miss it. And when you just get these big pieces you start to understand the whole thing and you could just go deeper and deeper okay so now at the bottom of your worksheet page four chapter three verse seven then they gave money to the masons and the carpenters why would you give money to them because masons and carpenters build right and who are the builders yeshua and zerubbabel and their brothers and they give them they gave them money, they gave them fruit, they gave them drink, they gave an, and they gave oil to the Sidonians and the Tyrian, Tyre and Sidon. We're gonna, that's on the map. We're going to see that again on the map. It's in Lebanon. It's north of Israel. Remember that? Okay. And that's where they got all their, their wood. 
So they gave money to the masons and the carpenters. They gave them food. They gave them drink. They gave oil to bring cedar wood from Lebanon. We see that a lot in the Old Testament. Where do you get the trees? You don't get them in Israel. Why not? In Israel, you got a bunch of rocks. And you have mountains. You have desert. Israel is not a big farm. Okay? Except for that they made it a big farm. They watered it. Oh, gosh, we have a lot to say about that, too. But at any rate, they had the cedar wood from Lebanon to the sea at Joppa, according to the permission they had from Cyrus, king of Persia. So when you hear Cyrus, king of Persia, you're thinking, oh, I know who he is. Second Chronicles chapter 36 at the end, Ezra chapter 1, verse 1. We got it. Who's, who's Cyrus? He's the king of Persia, 539 B.C., overtook the Persians overtook the Babylonians. The Babylonians overtook Judah in the south. They were, they were deported into, into Babylon. I'm saying this over and over. I'm trying to help you think. And you're rehearsing this in your mind. And you're going, I'm getting it. I'm learning it. Chapter 3, verse 8. Now, in the second year, and the second year of their coming to the house of God. Did you see that it says house of God? And the second year of their coming to the house of God. And they got in trouble for worshiping that house. Jeremiah 7, verse 14, and the house burned down, 2 Chronicles 36. But now in the second year, because King Cyrus was raised up to rebuild that house, the second year of their coming to the house of God at Jerusalem, in the second month, Zerubbabel and the rest of the brothers and the Levites and everybody, they came there, why? To oversee the house of the Lord. I have it underscored for you. See it on your worksheet? You see it on your Bible? Did you get it worked? Because you're following the story by the, the subject and the predicate. What happened? All these people came back. What are they doing? They, they're building, and now they're overseeing. Something's happening. A story is unfolding. This is not just a list of a bunch of inventory. This is an epic story. So they came back to oversee the house of the Lord. Chapter 3, verse 9. Then Yeshua... With his sons and all these brothers, they came to oversee the workmen of the temple. And now look in verse 10. Now, when the builders had laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord. Remember this, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, Jeremiah 7, remember that? When the builders had laid the foundation of the temple, the real temple of the real Lord, the real priest stood up in their apparel with trumpets, and the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with cymbals, they all stood up to praise the Lord according to the directions of King David of Israel. We know King David. He's a man after God's own heart. He was a good king, the king of the United Kingdom. Now, I just put a little rectangle on your sheet so you can see the Psalms of Asaph. Remember that? Sometimes you read a psalm, you're like, who is Asaph? Like, I'm com totally confused. I have no context. Now you do. The Psalms of Asaph, like especially Psalm 50. So maybe you have that for your devotion tomorrow. Look at Psalm 50. It's a Psalm of Asaph. And Psalms 73 through 83 are Psalms of Asaph. All right, they're of judgment, good and evil, and, and restoration. Because remember this? What's the judgment for? They were worshiping the house of the Lord. They're worshiping their cities. They're worshiping foreign gods. They're idolatrous. They lost their integrity. And so these Psalms correspond with the story of judgment and of good and evil, and then Ezra is all this restoration of our very kind, amazing God of grace. So now you've got this. Um, we could have an excursion to Psalm 50. I'm not going to do that right now. Let me try to get through Ezra. It's astounding when you read Psalm 50. You're going to go, oh, my stars, I have all the insight I hadn't seen before. It's not a coincidence, okay, that Ezra chapter 3 Verse 11 says, and they sang, and they sang, praising and giving thanks to the Lord. And they said, for he is good, for his loving kindness is upon Israel forever. So now you can guess this is what you're going to see, something like this in Psalm 50, right? Okay, so I'll let you look that up. Now, this next part is, I put it on your sheet, this next part so epic. If you understand it, men and women alike, because this is, this is, we're talking about buildings burning. We're talking about losing your sovereignty. <laughs> you have to think about it in terms of, I'm saying this stuff about America. I said not to, not to make a political statement right now, but so that we can understand the visceral impact, just how huge and overwhelming this story is. 
in this in chapter 3 verse 12 many of the priests and the levites and the heads of the father's households the old men the old men the old men who were there they lived it this is part of their life their history their childhood teenage years young married years they remember this the old men what does it say who had seen the first temple <laughs> They'd seen the first temple and they knew this one. They knew it burned. They saw the first temple in all its glory and beauty. And they saw it. And now they've seen, they're weeping with a loud voice because the foundation of the house, like we had a house, we loved it. We remember it. And then it was charred. It was just, it was just burned to a crisp. And now here it is again. And you've seen a conflagration total destruction of something and wept the loss of a place and memories and now there's this rebuilding you can see why they're weeping they weep with a loud voice when the foundation of this house was laid before their eyes why many shouted aloud for joy the young people hooray 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 we have the house and when you're old you're you're just you're just so overwhelmed with joy you, you're just crying and you're just crying so hard and loud. So the people could not distinguish. This is a very famous verse. The people couldn't distinguish between the sound of the shout of joy from the sound of weeping of the people. For the people shouted with a loud shout, and the sound was heard far away. Part of me just wants to close Ezra and just, just go, well, we've got to just park right there. <laughs> <laughs> and be so happy about this foundation and we want to cry with those who are crying and we want to cheer and jump around with those who are cheering and jump around and be part of the, all the clamor okay now we're to chapter four now when the enemies now look on your worksheet i put espionage if we have a movie you hear the music and it's becoming very ominous and everything seems so happy because we've got the joy and we've got the weeping Everybody's so thankful. An amazing thing has happened. A foreign king has gotten the money and the workers, and all this has happened. And now we have chapter four. We have the enemies. Chapter four, verse one. Now, when the enemies of the Jew, the enemies of Judah and Benjamin, when the enemies heard that the people of the exile were building a temple to the Lord God, a temple to that God, hold it. You're in a foreign land and you want to build a temple, a building to that God? I mean, you're in your land, but your land is overtaken. And you want to build a temple to that God? You're not building it to the Persian God? You're not building it to the Persian king? What is this? See, so these enemies think they're doing a good thing. These enemies have their own self-righteous thought of, hey, we're the right guys. We're the good guys. You are the bad guys. But this is written from a Jewish perspective and saying, okay, when the enemies of Judah and Benjamin heard that the people of the exile were building a temple. Now, isn't that interesting? It doesn't say that the Jewish people, that the Hebrews, it says the people of the exile. All of that is very deliberate. When the enemies of the Judah and Benjamin heard that the people of the exile were building a temple to the Lord God of Israel, they approached, we could even say, I mean, like they approached, hmm, they approached Zerubbabel and the heads of the fathers, and they say, let us build with you, because we, like you, seek your God. What is this? Wait, it says enemies are saying we want to build with you? Now, don't forget the music in the background that we're imagining, because remember, when people aren't following God, they lie. You have to remember when reading the Bible, there are people in the Bible who lie. They said, let us build with you, for we, like you, Seek your God, and we have been sacrificing to him since the days of Esarhaddon, king of Assyria, who brought us up here. Verse 3, chapter 4, but Zerubbabel and, Jer and Yeshua and all the other guys, they all say, you have nothing in common with us of building a house to our God. We're going to build it together. We're going to build it to the Lord God of Israel, as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, has commanded us. Chapter Chapter 4, verse 4, then the people of the land discouraged the people of the land. Who's that? The people of the land discouraged the people of Judah and frightened them from building. The people of the land are, are under that foreign government. And they discouraged them from building. Don't build. We don't want you to build a temple to your God right here. 
We don't want you to do that. And then they got scared. So the people of the land discouraged, discouraged, stole their courage. If you get discouraged, you, your courage got dissed. You lost courage because they scared you with their lies, with their intimidation. Chapter four, verse four. Then the people of the land discouraged the people of Judah and frightened them from building. Chapter four, verse five. And they hired, when you hire somebody, you pay them money. There's money involved in this. And they hired counselors against them. These counselors probably don't even care. They're just there for the money. They're hired. They're hirelings. They, they hired counselors against them to frustrate their counsel all the days of Cyrus, king of Persia, until the reign of Darius, king of Persia. <laughs> so you're like, this is so great. Cyrus has said, build, and we've got all this progress. And now we come here and the people who aren't Cyrus are scaring us and they don't want it. And we've been scared for so long, a lot of years, that we stopped and we had to wait for a whole nother ruler. We had to wait till we had a whole nother political setup here. And now you may have recognized the name Darius from the book of Daniel, right? So they had to wait all the way till the reign of Darius, who also was a king of Persia. Okay, now, so we're gonna get some history here. Chapter four, verse six. Now in the reign of Ahasuerus, in the beginning of his reign, they wrote an accusation against the inhabitants of Judah and Jerusalem. Okay, so look in your worksheet. Chapter, we're in chapter four, but let's go to page six on your worksheet. Y'all with me? Because I tried to make this a little more intelligible to you. The reign of Ahasuerus starts in 486, around 486, 485 BC, okay? So when did, when did Cyrus come in? 539. This is a lot of years later. This is decades later. So you can see why they got discouraged. They don't have the same leadership. It's not the same setup. It's really easy to be a, a reader of the Bible now and be a snob and going, oh, y'all shouldn't be discouraged. I'm sitting here in my chair drinking my coffee and I'm feeling fine and y'all should feel fine with me. They're not in your situation. So chapter four, verse six. Now the reign of Ahasuerus, in the beginning of his reign, they wrote an accusation against the inhabitants of Judah and Jerusalem. And in the days of Artaxerxes, and they've got all these names, Bishlam, Medridoth, Tabiel, and the rest of his colleagues, they wrote to Artaxerxes, king of Persia, and the text of his letter was written in Aramaic and translated from Aramaic. Okay, I have some more years for you to get straight who's in charge when. You can study your worksheet, but let's just go ahead, and I believe I have a, a chapter a, chapter four of our site that's supposed to say Rahum. It says Raham on your worksheet. That's R A. H-U-M, Rehum, the commander, and Shimshai the scribe, wrote a letter against Jerusalem to Artaxerxes as follows. It's a letter. They're appealing to the authority figure, and it's an accusation. Have you ever had a letter written to you filled with accusations? I've had that before. It's not very fun, and it can make your skin shake on your bones, even if in your mind you're like, I trust God. But it's just not very fun to be accused because we know it's clearly demonic, right? Jesus is the devil, is the accuser. Okay, so when someone's falsely accusing is the key, right? If you're confronting someone of the truth, you don't have to accuse them. It's not an accusation. It's a confrontation meant for their restoration. An accusation is meant for their destruction, their condemnation. It is not loving. And it is not to be mistaken from something loving to help somebody get delivered from the evil that is compromising their integrity. So now, look how I put this on your worksheet. I didn't do this for all of them, but I did it for some to make it really easy to see this as a letter. Because when you read your Bible, you've got verses and it looks like you're just kind of going through this litany of like Bible verses and you can miss the story. So the way I wrote it, I quit putting the verse numbers so you could see the letter. So here's the letter to King Artaxerxes. Your servants, and now let it be known to the king that the Jews 
who came up from you have come to us at Jerusalem and they're rebuilding and they're rebuilding the rebellious city. It's a rebellious evil city and they're finishing the walls and repairing the foundations. Now let it be known to the king that if that city is rebuilt and the walls are finished, they're not going to pay tribute or customer toll and it's going to damage the revenue of the king. See, they turn this glorious, wonderful work unto God. They, they reduce it to a financial matter. And Jesus tells us it's impossible. You serve God or you serve mammon. We see it today. If you're serving God, you tell the truth. You follow your commitments. You don't breach contracts. You don't do false accusations. You're looking for restoration for people. If you're a doctor, you're doing your surgery. You do the thing you're supposed to do. But when you compromise yourself and you, and you bow to mammon, now you're just looting and exploiting your job. You're a doctor who doesn't really give a hoot about the surgery. You're there for the money. You might, you might be an inebriated doctor. I'm making an analogy, a contemporaneous analogy for us to understand how realistic this is. They're coming in, they're making this Fox accusation. These Jews, remember the ethic story? They're crying. They're like, oh, the temple of God. He's so gracious. He's so great. And now they get falsely accused and said, this is all about money and they're not even going to pay taxes. That's a lie. It was not about money. And now the rest of that letter says now, because we are in the service of the palace. We're so great and trustworthy, even though they're liars. We are in the service of the palace, and it's not fitting for us to see the king's dishonor. We're just so true and noble. This was a bunch of baloney. Therefore, we have sent and informed the king so that a search may be made in the record of the books of your fathers. And you're going to discover in the record books, and you're going to learn that this city is a rebellious city. Now, remember, I told you this city is the most important city in the world, I believe. Jerusalem. Jerusalem's being attacked as a rebellious city, and it's damaging to kings and provinces, and that they've incited revolt within it in past days. Therefore, that city was laid waste. That's not true. The city was laid waste because they were being idolatrous. <laughs> they were not worshiping God. This is not a true story. We informed the king that if that city is rebuilt and the walls finished, as a result, you're going to have no possession in the province beyond the river. Now, what river is that? It's the river Euphrates, and you've got it on the map. Got it? So chapter 4, verse 17, then the king sent an answer, and now we've got another answer, another letter, and he says, peace. This is just kind of like formalities. This is like a boilerplate kind of Persian letter. And now the document which you sent us has been translated. What was it in? It was in Aramaic, right? It's been translated. And it's been read before me, and a decree has been issued from me, and a search has been made, and it has been discovered that this city has risen up against the kings in past days. That rebellion and revolt have been perpetrated in it, and that mighty kings have ruled over Jerusalem, governing all the provinces beyond the river, and that tribute, custom, and toll were paid to them. So now, issue a decree to make these men stop work, that the city may not be rebuilt until a decree is issued by me. And beware of being negligent. Why should damage increase to the detriment of the kings? Now let's look in chapter 4, verse 23. Then, as soon as the copy of King Artaxerxes, that document was read before Rahum and Shimshai, they're the enemies, they went in haste to Jerusalem, and they stopped them by force of arms. They got weapons out. We've got, this is all legitimized now. You can't do this. So now you got chapter 4, verse 24. Then the work of the house in Jerusalem ceased. And it was stopped until the second year of the reign of Darius, king of Persia. So Ezra's hard to read fast. I just wanted to stop after chapter 3. And I want to stop after chapter 4 and going, oh my goodness. So now we got chapter 5. In chapter 5. When the prophets, Haggai and Zechariah, now we know they're going to be like, yay, go house of God, rebuild. When the prophets prophesied to the Jews who were in Jerusalem and Judah, in the name of God, who was over them, then Zerubbabel and Yeshua, who are they? They're the builders. They arose because they got cheered on by the prophets. Come on. 
let's take heart. We were discouraged and now we're going to get our courage back. Let's get up and build, rebuild the house of God, which is in Jerusalem. Now, it's interesting it says which is in Jerusalem, because remember, that's the city that's getting accused of being a rebellious city. The real rebellion is when it's against God. When Israel's capitulating to all the foreigners and the foreign gods, that's when Israel's being rebellious. And so God lets the Babylonians come and char the thing. So the story's all contorted. Rebellion according to who? By what means? You know, which God? All of that. Okay, so Ezra. Chapter 5, verse 3. At that time, Tatanai, the governor beyond the river, beyond the Euphrates, and Shethar, Bozani, and their colleagues, they came to them and they said, all right, who issued you a decree to rebuild this temple and finish this structure? See, again, listen, when you try to do something for God and you honestly, with you sincerely are trying to do something for God, you're going to have trouble like you've never seen before. You will have trouble, especially if you try to build integrity and in the thing that has God's name on it. If it's a church, a Christian institution, a crisis pregnancy center, whatever it is, if they're wayward and they're doing stuff in the name of the Lord and there's a bunch of corruption going on, which sometimes happens, you try to clean it up, you're going to get falsely accused. You're going to have all kinds of stuff happening. Not always, but it happens and it happens a lot. And it seems like there's a very noticeable pattern of it happening. So now you got Ezra chapter 5, verse 4. Then we told them according to what the names of the men were. What does it say? We told them of who were reconstructing the building. That's scary. Now they're taking names. All right, who's doing this? You're like, oh gosh, my name's on that list. Who's doing the rebuilding? Oh, yay. Ezra chapter 5, verse 5. This is just such a great verse. But the eye of their God was on the elders of the Jews, and they did not stop them until the report should come to Darius. So see, they're trying to psych them out. Listen, somebody's trying to psych you out and say, stop doing that right thing. And you go, you know what? Just keep doing the right thing. And even though they say, we're going to stop you going, just keep doing it until you absolutely can't do it, because then you can start again when you can. And they had to wait until that time where that report gets to Darius. So now what happens is the eye of the God, God's eye is on him, protects him. And now chapter five, verse six, now they're going to write to Darius. And they say to Darius, king of all peace, let it be known to the king that we've gone to the province of Judah, to the house of the, oh, look at this, to the house of the great God. <laughs> I'm laughing when I'm reading this going, these people, these the truth is coming out because God is the great God. So I have that emboldened for you on the letter, on your worksheet. Let it be known to the king that we've gone to the province of Judah, to the house of the great God, which is being built with huge stones and beams. And these beams are being laid in the walls, and this work is going on with great care, and it's succeeding in their hands. Then we ask those elders, who issued you this decree? Who did this? Who gave you authority? Who authorized you to do this? You guys seem like you're insubordinate. Come on, who gave you authority to do this? We asked them the names, like, tell us who's the names. Who's the builder? Who this is? And they answered, and they said, we're servants of the God of heaven and earth. Now, that's a really bold answer. <laughs> because remember, S star, oh, my stars, Persians. This is a God of heaven and earth. The, the God of Israel is the God of those stars that y'all name your kids as, S star after. The sun God, remember? The, the treasurer, and I told you he has a Persian name, and it was a sun god, right? This is really interesting. That's a very bold statement, the God of heaven. What does it say? The God of heaven and earth? We're the servants of the God of heaven and earth, and we're rebuilding the temple that was built many years ago, which a great king of Israel built and finished. We know who that was. That was Solomon. A great king built it and finished, but because our fathers had, look how truthful they are. But because our fathers had provoked the God of heaven to wrath, the God of heaven gave them into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, the Chaldeans, and he destroyed this temple, and he just poured the people to Babylon. See, we're getting the history here. You're going, how do you know that history go? Because I read the book of Ezra. There it is. I mean, uh, the book of Ezra. There it is. Now you know, too. So he gave them into the hand of Babylon. And after the first year of Cyrus, the king of Babylon, King Nebuchadnezzar, had taken from the temple all that stuff out of Jerusalem, and he brought it back to this temple in Babylon. And now King Cyrus took it from the temple of Babylon, and they were given to the one whose name is Sheshbazzar, who he had appointed governor. And he, Cyrus, said to Sheshbazzar, 
take these utensils and go and deposit them in the temple of Jerusalem and let the house of God be rebuilt. Look at this, in its place. Wow, now we've got a displacement. Truth is displacing the lies. You take heart. Sometimes things seem so bleak and so dark and so impossible. And the God of heaven, who's over every last one of these people who are accusers, he's the God of the accusers. He's the God of your accusers. He's the God of heaven and earth, creator of heaven and earth. You trust in this God. Did you notice we haven't met Ezra yet? Isn't that interesting? Okay. So he says, in the house of God in Jerusalem, and from then until now, it's been under construction, and it's not yet completed. And now, if it pleases the king, let a search be conducted in the king's treasure house, which is in Babylon. If it be that a decree truly, really was issued by King Cyrus to rebuild this house of God at Jerusalem, then let the king send to us his decision concerning this matter. <laughs> and in chapter 6, we get another letter. And the king... Darius says a decree, and he goes, now, therefore, Tatnai, governor of the province of the beyond the river, and all the colleagues and everybody, and they're beyond the river, he says, keep away from there. You know, they're all over here far to the east of Israel, and they're going, everybody just stay away from there. They're on the other side, of the, they're on the west side of the Euphrates. Just stay away from there and leave this work on the house of God alone. Let the governor of the Jews, let the Israels, the elders of the Jews, let them rebuild this house of God on its site. Now, this is such a fabulous letter. Moreover, I, King Darius, King of Persia, I issue a decree concerning what you are to do for these elders. Not only are we not going to stop them, but look at this. We're not going to stop them, but you're going to get to go rebuild this house of God, and it's going to be the full cost is paid. We're going to fund this thing. We're not going to stop them. We're going to give them a bunch of money and let them finish. And it's going to be paid to these people from the royal treasury out of the taxes of the provinces beyond the river. And that without delay, that without delay, give them the money, let them build it. This is an amazing thing. And whatever is needed for a burnt offering, I love it, to the God of heaven, to the God over Persia is what this is implying. To the God over the Persian gods. That's what this is implying. And search was made in the archives where the treasures were stored in Babylon. And in Ekbatana, in the fortress, which is in the province of Medea, a scroll was found and there was written as follows. And so you see this scroll, and I didn't type all of it out in chapter six. And we see this story flowing the 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 the, the this is just forwarding the building now we finally get to chapter seven after these things it's really critical that you understand after these things it didn't happen before these things it didn't happen simultaneously to these things all of this stuff that i've been describing all that stuff happened for and then after all this in the reign of artaxerxes the king of Persia, there went up Ezra. In a movie, we'd have to change the music. We'd have to get the scene to where there's a big feature on Ezra. After these things, in the reign of Artaxerxes, king of Persia, there went up Ezra, the son of Zariah, son of Azariah, son of Hilkiah, son of Shalom, son of Zadok, son of Ahitub, son of Amariah and Azariah, and Mario, and Zerahiah, and Uzi, and Buki, and Abishua, and Phineas, and Eleazar, son of Aaron, the chief priest. This goes back. Aaron is Moses' brother, right? Moses, Moses' brother is a Levite. Okay, let's let's think this through. Moses' brother is a Levite, and he's the chief Levite priest. That means Moses must also be a Levite. He must himself be a priest. Exodus 19.6, a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And so now God's got Ezra the priest who's got this incredible genealogy. We go, what are all these boring genealogies doing in the Bible? They're telling us how incredible God's providence is and how so-and-so begets so-and-so and it all happened in history it's all providentially 
God is overseeing the whole story so that we could be in awe of his oversight. And he's forwarding the story, even though people are sending up such a storm that he had to let the Babylonians come and burn down the temple. We're having all of our freedom and God's still doing his sovereignty. Amazing. Amazing. So now in chapter seven, chapter seven, verse six, this Ezra, which Ezra? That Ezra. The Ezra who's kin to all those people all the way down to Aaron. This Ezra went up from Babylon and he was a scribe skilled in the law of Moses, which the Lord God of Israel had given and the king granted him all he requested. Here's why. Because the hand of the Lord, his God was upon him. So Ezra is going to be doing all this wonderful reform. And now look, in chapter 7, verse 8, and he, Ezra, came to Jerusalem in the fifth month, verse 9, and on the first day of the month, he began to go up from Babylon, we understand that, and on the first of the fifth month, he came to Jerusalem, because the good hand of his God was upon him. I memorized this next verse, Ezra chapter 7, verse 10. 30, 40 years ago. I love this verse. For Ezra had set his heart to study the law of the Lord, to practice it. That's integrity. To study the law of the Lord, to practice it, and to teach it. Study it, practice it, teach it. See, the whole point that you study it is to practice it. And this is where we lose our integrity. Because we often have a thing where, oh yeah, we studied it, and then we just bragged that we studied it. We didn't practice it. And you have to have reform movements to come back and go, everybody, you study it and you practice it. And then you teach it again to other people so they too can practice it. Let's look at this verse. For Ezra had set his heart. Don't you love that? He set his heart. He set his heart there. This isn't about money. This is not prestige. This isn't, hey, I'm the big hoodie twat. Ezra, everybody shut up and listen to me. I'm going to be the big mega. And I'm going to get all the credit for attracting the people. And I'm going to be the big guy. That's not it. He set his heart. Do you hear this? Ezra set his heart to study the law of the Lord and to practice it and to teach God's, his statutes, not Ezra's statutes, not Ezra saying, you know what? I don't really like this policy. I don't really want to do this policy. Golly, this one makes me be humble. Oh, wow, I won't get near as big a salary if I do that. Uh-oh, I'll have to admit it a lot if I do that one. Oh, God doesn't want us to lie or cheat or steal. Oh, gosh, we don't get to have sex with everybody in the whole world we want to have sex with. Wow, I don't really like that. That's not what this says at all. It's, this is, Ezra is a book of contrasting extreme corruption with, with just remarkable integrity. Listen, it is possible on planet Earth with fallen people to have integrity. And if somebody says, oh, we can't really have integrity, it's just going to be so compromised anyway. I would just say, you know what? That doesn't match the book of Ezra. And do I think Ezra is part of the main story or not? Yes, I think it is part of the main story. Because integrity is possible with repentance. Integrity is possible. And somebody sets their heart to study the law of God and to practice it and to teach his statutes in all of Israel his statutes, his ordinances in Israel. We can do that. It's possible. So now, Ezra chapter 7, verse 11. Now this is the copy of the decree which King Artaxerxes gave to Ezra the priest the scribe, learn it in the words of the commandments of the Lord and his statutes to Israel. Isn't that quite as, look at that, isn't that inspiring? Ezra is such a great role model. Remember all you teachers, Anybody who's a preacher, anybody who actually wants to convey as a disciple maker, parents, you look at this and he's Ezra, the priest, the scribe, learned in the words of the commandments of the Lord and his statutes to Israel. That Ezra wrote to Artaxerxes. So you see here on your worksheet, we're on page, on your worksheet, we're on page eight. Now this time I didn't, I didn't indent to make the letter so easy. Because I'm letting you follow with that letter, the verses. And you could write out that letter yourself. You could see it. And, and Ezra says, Artaxerxes, king of kings, to Ezra the priest. This is the letter from Artaxerxes, king of kings. And it's to Ezra, the priest, the scribe of the law of the God of heaven. Again, the God who's over Artaxerxes. 
perfect peace. Now he's got that same form later. It doesn't say just peace. It says perfect peace. And then he says, for as much as you were sent by the king and his seven counselors to inquire Judah and Jerusalem according to the law of your God, which is in your hand, and to bring all this money and all this stuff to, to the God of Israel, whose dwelling is in Jerusalem, with all this money, verse 16, with this money, verse 17, you're going to diligently buy the bulls, the rams, the lambs, the grain offerings, the libations, all of this stuff for the altar. Remember, they built the altar. Why an altar? Because you make sacrifices as a priest to God, because God wants a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. And you're going to have all the stuff for the altar. You're going to have the, the oil, the libation, and all the animal sacrifices. And the altar of the house of your God, which is in Jerusalem. That's Ezra chapter 7, verse 18. And Artaxerxes says to Ezra, whatever seems good to you and to your brothers, just do whatever you need to do with that money, that whatever is your, the will of your God. Now, this is incredible. You have a blank check, and we trust your integrity that you're going to actually give it to God. You're going to actually get, put the money where the money's supposed to go. You're going to actually follow the policy, the statute, the ordinance. Isn't this great? If anybody's sad about integrity being broken, Read Ezra, and it'll cheer you up. And even though there's setbacks and there's enemies and accusations and all that stuff, the God of Israel has got his eye on, and he knows. And you set your heart to, to study it and practice it. And teach these, his statutes and ordinances and all of Israel. And you see, and God put all this favor on him and said, y'all guys do whatever you need to do. And that's what all this chapter 7 is. Chapter 7, verse 23. Whatever is commanded by the God of heaven, let it be done with zeal. Now, isn't that interesting? Think about Jeremiah 7. The temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. And they made it a den of robbers. Remember this? And then it, if you skip in your mind to John chapter 2, Jesus is overturning the tables. And he says, the zeal of the Lord, right, is going to accomplish this when Jesus cleared the temple. And now here's a foreign leader, Darius, telling Ezra in chapter 7, verse 23, whatever is commanded by the God of heaven, let it be done with zeal. All of that is, there, there's not a, that's not a coincidence that that's happening. And now Ezra, verse 25, you got to appoint magistrates and judges and get everybody to judge and get them to judge according to law. And look at verse 26. And whoever does not observe the law of your God and the law of the king, let judgment be executed upon him strictly, whether for death or banishment or confiscation for good, for goods or imprisonment. You have authority from A to Z. Do it God's way. And Ezra so trusted by a foreign king to go back miles and miles away. You look at that map. This is very far away. King Darius is not micromanaging this. And he's letting Ezra do all this. And so now, chapter 7, verse 27, 28, this is from Ezra. Blessed be the Lord. Oh, blessed be the Lord, the God of our fathers, who's put such a thing as this in the king's heart. See how Ezra gives God credit? Ezra not saying, ha, 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 ha. Artaxerxes likes me. I'm the pet. I'm the hot shot here. He doesn't do that at all. He's coming back and blown away, and he's going, blessed be the Lord, the God of our fathers. God put such a thing. God gets the credit. God put the, such a thing as in the king's heart to adorn the house of the Lord, which is in Jerusalem. Integrity, integrity, integrity. Verse 28, and God has extended loving kindness to me. If you've experienced God's loving kindness, and he sees you're just blown away and going, oh, God even extended loving kindness to me to me before the king and his counselors and before all the king's mighty princes thus i was strengthened says ezra i was strengthened according to the hand of the lord my god his hand was upon me and i gathered leading men from israel to go up with me and don't you know those people who went with them were just so happy to go <laughs> ezra is the leader but ezra is not about ezra it's about god and some of us are the Ezra and some of us are the ones who get to go with. And the joy is just the same because it's about the God and his great God, our great God. Now we've got chapter eight. 
in chapter eight. Now I want to show you this. We've talked about heads before, and I didn't say it so clearly, but some of you women are worried about head and headship and the husband's the head of the wife and you're all worried going, these men sure just look like leader and you might be getting nervous. Okay, other people are going, wait, the husband is the head and he is a leader. What is this nervous? We got a whole debate there, don't we? Okay, here's what I want to say. Ezra chapter eight. Now these are the heads. When you read the Greek translation of the Hebrew here, it's not the word kephale like in Ephesians 5. It's archon, but it's put in plural. And archon means leader. So there's no debate here. This does not get into the women's debate, okay, with the word head. So if you're reading this and thinking that, you're mistaken, okay? And let's get that cleared up. So chapter 8, all these heads and the genealogies of enrollment of those who, what does it say, chapter 8? These are the people who went up with me from Babylon in the reign of the king of Artaxerxes. So remember, Ezra's going to go up and they're saying, you get to go and you're going to get all these libations and all the sacrifices. You're going to get everything all sorted out and you're going to basically bring about all this restoration. Ezra is a great reformer. Ezra is a Martin Luther way before Martin Luther. We're going to restore the integrity. Okay. And so then what happens is if we get down to chapter 8, verse 21. Then Ezra proclaimed, he says, I, the I in that verse is Ezra. Then I, Ezra, proclaimed a fast there at the river of Ahava. The river of Ahava runs just west. It runs westbound, kind of runs toward Israel from the Euphrates. And it's hard to actually place it. I tried to find a good map for you and I can't find it, but it's north of Babylon. We'll put it that way. And it's on the Euphrates River, kind of. I'll show you another map here in a jiffy. So he proclaims a fast at the river of Ahava, that we might humble ourselves before our God to seek him because we want a safe journey. So we say, why do we pray? Because they pray to the Bible for a safe journey. A lot of bad things can happen on a journey, right? Remember the, the Good Samaritan? Yeah, that guy got hurt on a journey. To seek from him a safe journey for us and our little ones. we got all the little kids. we got possessions. A bandit could come steal stuff from us, right? We don't have a locked car to drive in. So here we go, and we proclaimed a fast, and we asked for help from God. And in chapter 8, verse 22, Ezra says, I was ashamed to request from the king troops and horsemen to protect us, because I just told him how great God is. <laughs> so I didn't want to say, oh, God's so great, but by the way, we need um, some Persian help here. <laughs> he just kind of went for it, and he's like, I was too embarrassed to tell him that. So we're fasting and going, oh, God, you've got to help us. Because we had said to the king, the hand of our God is favorably disposed to all who seek him, but his power and his anger against those who forsake him. Verse 23, chapter 8. So we fasted and we sought our God concerning this matter and God listened to our entreaty. Yay. And so then all this success happens and they go back by verse 33. They get the treasure placed in the temple. Remember, they've got all these possessions. They've got a whole bunch of riches because they're going to restock, restore, refurbish the temple. This is like carrying treasures through a huge long journey and they make it. That in itself is amazing without governmental protection. God protects them. I just can't imagine how amazed they were by that, to live it. So now in chapter 9, after all of this wonderful stuff, so they end up journeying in chapter 8. Now, let's look at this map because they have all this financial integrity. Everything goes where we're supposed to go. Do you see this map on your worksheet chapter for chapter 8? I've just got it here on page 9 of your worksheet. You can see... See, look, where, see where it says Babylon and see that red line? That's their, that's their route. They're traveling westbound toward the Mediterranean, but they kind of make a, a rainbow. They come back in the form of an arc. They go up. They, have to, they go northbound. And why do they do that? It's because of the terrain. It's not so easy. You can't just have a road right through. There are reasons for that, and there's a lot of desert and that kind of stuff. And so then they go down through the cities because you've got to have provisions, right? So it makes a lot of sense. And then they go down to Jerusalem. So right where it says Babylon, see where it says Babylon? You see where it says to the right of that, which says Tigris? The river uh, Ahavala is kind of just a little bit north of where it says Babylon, kind of along the Euphrates, kind of around in that area, okay? The river of Ahava. So in chapter nine, there's a question of why does it matter who the Israelites marry? 
and you should know the answer because this is all about, uh-oh, they married the wrong people and now, now what? The problem is Exodus chapter 19, verse 6, a holy nation, kingdom of priests. And here you are in chapter 9, verse 1, you're marrying the daughters of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the Ammonites, the Moabites, the Egyptians, the Amorites. What is this? After all this epic, amazing stuff, <laughs> oh, you're like, oh, Lord, help us to have integrity. How did we blow it again? So. There's a prayer here that Ezra prays. In chapter 9, verse 6, he says, Oh my God, I am ashamed and embarrassed to even lift up myself to you. I can't believe we've sinned like crazy after all this. And I didn't type that out for you because I want you to type it out. I want you to write it out in your journal. Write that out. Look at Ezra's prayer. And then you get to chapter 10. And when Ezra was praying and making confession, Ezra is so truthful. He's not defensive. He's bringing integrity. Hey, listen, you don't have to be perfect to have integrity. You've got to repent and confess your sin. God is a God of grace. There's so much grace of God, but he wants truth. Remember, Jeremiah, is there one person? Will anybody tell the truth? Listen, the way you tell the truth about everything else, the way you can discern the truth is tell the truth about your own sin. Tell the truth when you lied, when you postured, when you intimidated. Tell the truth when you cheated, when you stole, when you made yourself look better. Whatever it is, your sexual stuff, your money stuff, I don't know what your favorite sin is. Tell on yourself. You can't imagine how fast your faith will grow. You'll see how great God is. You repent. You get your actions in line. So chapter 10, while Ezra was praying and making confession and weeping and prostrating himself before the house, the house, we're still about that temple, before the house of God, a very large assembly of men and women and children gathered to him from Israel and everybody's crying. And, and what you're going to have is a big revival. Ezra ends up with a whole big revival. Everybody's crying. Everyone's so sorry. Everybody's going, I sinned this way. Me too. And I did this. And you look by the time you get to Ezra 10, chapter Chapter 10, verse 18, the sons of Yeshua. We know who Yeshua is. He's the guy of the builder. He built the altar. And his sons are the ones marrying these foreign wives. And they're confessing, I did it. I'm guilty. I plead guilty too. Me too. Look what I did. And they make it right. They don't just sit at the bar and drink and talk about what their sins are. They put down the liquor. They go make things right. They fix it, restore it, straighten up their actions. They become like Ezra. They practiced the law. Ezra set his heart to study the law of God and to practice it. And now they've got Ezra here as a reformer. And the people realize after Ezra's appalled in chapter 9. And they make it right. You can have done an appalling thing. We have appalling things happening in our institutions that call themselves Christian. And it's still not too late to make things right. So now you get all these details about who all married all the right whatever people. And then you finally get in verse 44. And all these had married foreign wives. And some of them had wives by whom they had children. And that ends the book of Ezra. It ends on such a sort of seeming anticlimax that you're, you're just left. I'm left feeling so convicted going, I've got to make things right. I've got to be like Ezra and set my heart to study the law of God and practice it and teach his statutes and his ordinances to other people so that they have a chance of knowing what it is so they can follow the policy, follow the commandment, follow the statute, follow the ordinance and meet the God of heaven over all the foreign governments, over us, the God who restored and this temple being restored with the altars and getting the foreigners to provide the money and God making it all happen. And at the end, you just go, blessed be the, the Lord God. Praise the Lord. Yes, this is part of the story, my friends. God bless you.